All right, back from break. Um, here's the example that we were looking at. <clears throat> Just a reminder. Um, we've got a converging lens. We've got an object that's been placed inside the focal point for that converging lens. And uh, we're just doing a ray diagram. So we're doing a ray diagram and we're going to calculate the numbers on this. It says that the object is placed 10 centimeters from a 15 centimeter focal length converging lens. So um, it looks like their ray diagram looks pretty good this time. Uh, we've got the lens. Remember, we're going to treat the center uh, of the lens, uh, a center uh, plane running through there. So that's my 15 centimeters is right there, my 10 centimeters is right there, and then you start drawing those lines. So we've, we've taken a look at that, and uh, so I, I guess we can move on. And then <clears throat> here are all the calculations. Uh, here is using that uh, DI DO, di, uh, DO DI diagram or, or function uh, to analyze some of the possibilities for this lens. All right, um, so here's another example. This time we're going to be using a diverging lens. So we've seen a couple of examples now where we had a converging lens that we were using. Let's look at the diverging lenses. You know, the diverging lenses, they're a little trickier. So we just have to pay attention with these diverging lenses. It says, with this diverging lens, there's a small insect. That's the object. It's going to get placed, um, or where should we have it placed, so that we get a virtual image 20 centimeters from the lens um, on the same size as the object. They give us the focal length for the lens. So um, here is the setup. So the information that's been given in this example They've given us the focal length, which is uh, 25 centimeters, but they said it's diverging. So I know that when I run the equations on this, I got to get a minus sign put in for the, uh, for the focal length. Now they told us that uh, we want to produce a virtual image located 20 centimeters from the lens. So I've written down my given information here. And then over here, what I've done is I've drawn the diagram. Now, here is my central axis. We've seen those in the, in the other diagrams. And then the, here's my, here's my uh, lens right here. So again, uh, it, it's worth writing down that it's a diverging lens. Ooh, which I, I did, I guess, up here. Uh, but as far as drawing these diagrams, you can just draw a straight line to represent that lens. Uh, that works really well. So... Um, they didn't give us a height. I'm just going to pick some object. I like triangles. And so I've got this narrow triangle with this tip up here. And I'm going to work from the point at the top of the triangle. And uh, here we go. Uh, I've got the lens located here. It says that the uh, image is going to be located uh, 20 centimeters and that the focal length is 25. So I've scaled that. This is my 20 centimeters here. This is my 25. I got a focal point on both sides. Remember, that's what we're going to end up with, is we're going to have uh, focal points on both sides of these, um, of these lenses. And then um, <clears throat> the image is scaled so that it's at 20 centimeters. All right, so uh, let's see how that is, uh, is going to work. Now, for this diagram, um, I guess we could work back and forth. Let me do this. Let me go ahead and just run the math first. So, um, it says that we want to find out where should I place the object, which I guess is a small insect or something. So, where should the object be placed in order to get this image? Uh, I'm bringing in the formula for focal lengths, object lengths, and image uh, distances. And um, I'm, I'm rearranging it to solve for the unknown value. And what I'm ending up with is a DO that's plus 100 centimeters. Um, okay, so we've solved that. And they also want to know what the magnification is. So the magnification we're going to get uh, for this particular setup is 0.20. And it looks like it's 
it's positive. So that's running the formulas. Now, in running the formulas, it was important that I got the signs right. I had to make sure that I had the, you know, the minus signs uh, for the diverging lens, uh, and then the minus sign for the um, virtual image. So those both came out as minus. Now, <clears throat> what we could do, I guess we could do this a couple different ways here. Uh, we could take the information that we have now, and just and and draw the diagram. So now that I know that I've got an object at 100 centimeters, uh, I could draw the object here and start from the object. Now, if I start from the object, I could take uh, object light path here, bring it up to my diverging lens, and then since it is a diverging lens, I want to angle the light coming out, <clears throat> the image light in a way where it's, it's directed away from the focal point on this side. So I'm going to get that first path uh, heading out in that direction. Now another, um, and so I put the dashed line in here. Okay, so that dashed line lines up with uh, path number one, the image light. Uh, and then what we're going to do is, we've, we've now used this focal point so I want to use this focal point. Now to use the other focal point, we're going to take, I guess that's path number three. Uh, I'm going to take path number three and bring that in as if, and I didn't get the dashed lines here, so there are dashed lines right there. So when I had my uh, straight edge, when I had my ruler set up, uh, I drew th line number three of my object light in a way where it was headed right towards that focal point. So light that's, that's coming together as it approaches the uh, diverging lens is going to be diverged away. And that's what's happening here. So here's path number three, and it div diverges away from that central axis. Now, I actually think I did this one second. So uh, path number two just goes right through the center. That's the easy one. And that works for converging lenses. That works for diverging lenses. Either way you want to do that, uh, that one's going to work. Uh, <clears throat> and then what we can do then is uh, path number one had to be brought back with some dashed lines. Path number three had to be brought back with dashed lines. Path number two, it's just straight through. It's just a solid line. You know, how, you know that's why it's my favorite, I guess. That's an easy one that you can... I shouldn't put this out here as a challenge, but that's a difficult one to get wrong, right? All right. Um, so these three paths coming in, and then they diverge. Uh, they did all cross at that one location. So that's where I'm going to say the image is located. When I look at those diagrams, that image is consistent with being 20 centimeters away. Okay. And if you do this really, really carefully, you're going to get it, you know, with the ruler and some that's that's marked very carefully with millimeters and whatever. Excuse me. Whatever. Uh, that. Um, that lines right up with uh, the values that we had. Now, what would happen if we imagined that we didn't know uh, any of this stuff? Let's say that we, we tried to do this all from the diagram, and the only information we had to go with were these given values. Well, we could still do that. What we could do is we could take this as a, an image and run this line up from the focal point through the image to see where light would be heading away, identify this point, and then this would be drawn backwards. So image and objects can always be interchanged. Remember we saw this, I think we saw this with mirrors too, but the way that the formula works, images and objects can always be switched back and forth. If I find a set of solutions, that corresponds to um, an image, I, I can find a set of solutions that corresponds, uh, I can reverse the image in the object and find another set of solutions for that. Okay. Now, the last item uh, I guess we should look at here is um, our function, our D-I-D-O function. Um, 
And in this case, what we found was the DO was real. It's got a positive value on it. The DI is, uh, the image is virtual. And so that's got a uh, negative value on it. Uh, <clears throat> when we do these diagrams for a diverging lens, the asymptotes end up being in on the negative side. So the asymptotes are drawn at the locations where uh, DO is equal to the focal length. Well, the focal length's negative, so DO is going to be a negative value at that point. And then the other asymptote is uh, also at uh, DI is equal to the focal length. So it flips the asymptotes to opposite sides, and when we draw the hyperbola, the hyperbola, what we find with the hyperbola coming through there is uh, that's also shifted. So you'll notice with the diverging lens, um, there is no R to R solutions. There's, there aren't any solutions that take us from a real object to a real image uh, for that. And, um, and then I, I graph this out, I guess. Um, one, two, three, four. Each of these is 25. So uh, the point on the graph that we're looking at is here. That's taking a real object and uh, creating a virtual image. So the real object has a, a positive value to it. The virtual image has a negative value to it. And there is a solution uh, off in that quadrant. Okay, so um, that's good. We've got examples now that we've looked at with uh, converging lenses, uh, converging lenses with objects outside the focal point, converging lenses with objects inside the focal point, and then we also just took a look at uh, diverging uh, images and what, um, or diverging lenses, sorry, diverging lenses and where the objects and images can end up with those. Now, uh, now we want to take a look at a couple of examples where we combine lenses. So we're not just going to have one lens, we're going to have two lenses or more. And uh, what this is telling us is that in these situations where we have a, a multiple lens system, so here's lens A, here's lens B, each of these lenses is going to have its own focal length. Now, in this case, they kind of draw it. Um, as if they're, well, I guess they're not quite identical. Uh, the focal length on lens A is 20 centimeters. Focal length on lens B is 25. So we've got both those lenses drawn. We've got focal points identified for each of the, uh, each of the two lenses, lens A and lens B. <clears throat> and then what it's showing here is that there's an 80 centimeter separation between the two lenses. Now, there's a couple things that can happen here. Uh, first of all, if we start with an object over here uh, and send light into this lens, it's a converging lens, so uh, maybe it's going to be able to bring the light back together. But what happens if uh, it brings the light back together, you know, in this region, or what would happen if the light was not quite brought together by this lens? Now they've drawn um, they've drawn a diagram for us, so they've actually drawn in the diagram, suggesting to us that um, we haven't verified this yet, but uh, they are suggesting. They're suggesting that we're going to get a real image at this location, uh, and then we're going to pick up that real image from here, and uh, that's going to serve as an object for the next lens. So the idea is just to do two problems uh, consecutively. Let, let's see how that works. Uh, they've got this um, diagram set up here that kind of shows everything. But So what we're going to do is uh, start out with that first object, the first object was placed 60 centimeters away from lens number one. So here is lens number one. Here is its object. Here is the formula uh, relating image and object distances. I've solved that. 
And that says that we're going to get um, an image located uh, 30 centimeters from the lens. So we've calculated the 30 centimeters here. Now, the magnification value turns out to be minus 0.5. So the image is going to be real. It's going to be inverted. And again, everything we've calculated in that column just corresponds to lens 1. We haven't even thought about lens 2 now. Uh, so, and here is what uh, that looks like. So, let's see. Uh, yeah, here we go. So the object was placed at 60 centimeters. Here's the original or the starting object, 60 centimeters away. And I think that image distance we calculated was 30. So, I mean, it it's, should be straightforward enough here um, that it's a, it's a converging lens. We've calculated the numbers, and um, but it is kind of interesting how they've done that diagram and added that fourth line. So that all, that should all seem fine. Now what we got to do is this. Once we've identified that this is where this image is going to be located, this is now going to serve as the object for the next lens. So we got to decide how much distance that's going to be. Now what we can do, I guess I didn't get a diagram, a separate diagram, so I'm going to have to keep flipping back to theirs. So this total distance here was 80 centimeters, and we've now solved that that distance right there is 30 centimeters. So if we take the 80 centimeters and subtract off the 30 centimeters, we're left with 50 centimeters. So it looks like that object for the second lens, this image right here that's going to become the object for the second lens, uh, is located 50 centimeters away. So we've now identified um, this as being, let's see, focal length 2, uh, it's lens number 2, uh, the object is going to be located at 80 centimeters minus the 30 centimeters that we determined here. That's going to leave us at, at 50 centimeters. So we're just going to reuse the equation again. I mean, it's kind of doing the very same thing all over again. This time we're getting an image distance of 50. So the focal length is a little different value. Uh, the object distance is a little different value. Um, so we're getting another image that is real and inverted. <clears throat> now, since the DO is 50, the DI is 50, the magnification is going to be negative 1. So we're going to get an inversion, and let's see if they've scaled things. They really haven't, so they haven't quite scaled things. I'm sorry, you guys should draw a ray diagram for this and, uh, and verify this all works. Um, this is 50 centimeters on this side. This is supposed to be 50 centimeters over on this side also. Uh, so we're going to get a magnification. Notice that that we ended up saying that there was an inversion for both lenses. So the inversion just has to do with how is the image oriented relative to the object. Now in this case, uh, we've got an inversion here. This image is upside down compared with this one. But this image is also inverted uh, relative to its object. And so we're going to get an inversion on both and that flips the, uh, the final image back up. So the final image matches the orientation of the original object. So again, this is a good one to go back and uh, do your own uh, diagram on, maybe, would be a good idea. And then the net magnification. So if we're going to get a net magnification, and another thing you could do is actually you could check my numbers too, but they seem to check out. See if there's... See if I've made an error here, because the numbers I got don't really match up with the diagram they provided. So uh, the net magnification uh, would come from M1 times M2. You know, if we make something half as big with the first lens, and then the next image is the same size, well, 
that's the one half times the uh, one, and that's giving us an overall magnification 0 0.50. Okay. All right. So multiple lenses, uh, it can be it can be a little tricky, uh, but with the multiple lenses. Um, With the multiple lenses, uh, you can treat them as just being successive, um, successive lenses. Okay. Now this is kind of an interesting one. It's another combination of lenses, and uh, what's happening here is they're putting the two thin lenses right next to each other. Uh, so it says to measure the focal length of a diverging lens, a converging lens is placed in contact with it. Uh, sun's rays uh, are focused by this combination at a point 28.5 centimeters behind the lenses as shown. Uh, if the converging lens has a focal length of 16 centimeters, what's the focal length of the diverging lens? Now that last line is important. It says, assume both lenses are thin and that the space between them is negligible. So we're treating this, you know, we've been treating these lenses as if the front and back surfaces are essentially lined up. They're really thin between the two. And now what we're doing is we're taking a divert two lenses and saying that it applies to both lenses. So, uh, so the front and back surfaces of both lenses can be treated as if they're just at the same location. All right, so let's get this thing set up. Now, um, qualitatively, what we're expecting will happen here is let's let's draw some uh, let's draw some ray lines here. So here comes the rays in from the sun. They're coming in parallel. The sun's way, way, way far away. And notice that uh, if we just had the converging lens, then the converging lens is bringing the light together so that it would reach a point, it would reach a focus uh, at that uh, location. Um, <clears throat> now this uh, is going to be able to serve as an object point for our second lens. And so what's happening is the light comes in, it converges, but then the diverging lens diverges it, and that means that <clears throat> the images, the image is going to get created in this case, um, is going to be farther out. So we're expecting this is going to be farther out. Uh, we want the combination to give us an image at 28.5 centimeters. So here we go. Now lens one, what are we going to use for a DO? Because hey, it's the sun and the light's coming in parallel. Well, if the light's coming in parallel, then DO is equal to infinity. So, and infinity works in our equation. One over infinity just becomes zero. And so what's going to happen here is that um, we're going to end up with a di that matches the focal length. So here's the do. The do, one over do, goes away. I'm left with di. Uh, di is equal to 16 centimeters because the focal length is equal to 16. So that... That um, lets us know where that image is going to be located or what the focal length is. Now what we can do then is we can pick that up and say that the um, image created from the first lens is going to show up at negative 16. So let's go back to that diagram we were looking at. All right, so the converging lens has a focal length of 16 centimeters, and that says that the di, this distance right here, is going to be equal to that 16 centimeters. That's going to be the image distance. Um, <clears throat> and then if that's at 16 centimeters, then um, its image can be calculated, or its distance from that lens uh, can be calculated by taking the minus 16. So uh, this is serving as an object for this lens, and it's starting out at minus 16 centimeters. 
So that's what we've got for an object distance here is negative 16. So that's negative 16. Now they told us we want the image to show up at 28.5 centimeters. We can plug that number, those numbers in and find that we want a focal length of uh, negative 36.5 uh, centimeters. All right, um, so uh, a couple of good examples with um, combining lenses. Now let's move on and uh, take a look at what's called the lens maker equation. And so for the lens maker's equation, um, this is telling us when we create like a, um, <clears throat> let's say that we're making some corrective lenses. So we want to make some corrective lenses that will have certain focal properties. Well, what we can do is uh, we can determine what the focal length of that will be by using the index of refraction of the material. So we have to know what the uh, end value is for the material. And then the other thing that we want is the radiuses of curvature uh, for the two surfaces. So we want to find out what radius of curvature we will have uh, for the two surfaces uh, of the lens. And the formula works out uh, to be the formula that we see here. Uh, we're not going to go through the derivation, but uh, you can kind of see the setup for how the derivation is being carried out. Let me take a quick break here. All right, so, um, so yeah, there it is. Lens maker equation, this is an example of uh, what the lens looks like. And then there's the equation telling us how we design a lens so it will have certain focal properties and we want to follow that up with an example. So here we go. Uh, calculate the focal length for um, this lens. It's a converging lens because it's, it's thicker in the middle. It's thinner around the edges. And um, it's made out of a material that has an index of refraction of 1.50. Now, it may be that if you, you know, if you wear corrective lenses and you've been to the optometrist and you've picked out some lenses for your glasses, um, it may be they ask you about uh, which index of refraction material do you want to use. I know when I was a kid uh, growing up, I had a fairly hefty prescription and uh, you could get the uh, higher index of refraction and um, then the lenses didn't have to be quite as thick. If the uh, end value is larger, then uh, we don't need quite as much thickness on the lens and then, and then they're not as heavy. Uh, the lenses are not going to be quite as heavy if we use a material with a higher index of refraction. So uh, here's the lens. Now what they're showing us is this. Uh, the lens has two curvatures of radius, or radiuses of curvature, sorry. Two radiuses of curvature, and uh, one of these is 22.4 centimeters. So this is the shorter radius of curvature, and you can see this is a tighter curve. If I continue this curve around, uh, it's only going to have a radius of 22.4 centimeters. Now, the other surface uh, has a radius of curvature of 46.2 centimeters. So those are just some numbers that they gave us. And that's not as tight of a curve. That curve would correspond to a circle or a sphere with a larger radius to it. So these are two spherical surfaces uh, that we're looking at for those uh, lenses. Now, they've put a plus sign on one of those surfaces, but they put a minus sign on the other one. And so uh, what the, the way this works is the uh, positive signs go with a, a convex uh, or a converging type surface, and uh, the negative signs go with a concave or a diverging type surface. Now, when you've got a mixed set of surfaces like this, one's uh, concave, one's converging, one's diverging. 
the one with the lower radius of curvature wins out. So this front surface is more converging than the back surface is diverging. And so we're expecting the overall uh, focal length to be a positive quantity for this uh, particular setup that we, um, that we have here. All right, um, let's run the numbers and see what we end up with. So example 33.7, um, here is, right here, is my formula for the lens maker equation. And I've written down the given information. I've got the index of refraction for that, uh, index of refraction of the material that we're making it out of. And then I have the two radiuses of curvature, one that's convex and one that's concave. And I've put the opposite signs on it. Now the formula looks something like this. So I just, I plugged all the numbers in. I ended up with a focal length of 87.0 centimeters. And I thought, you know, maybe we should calculate the power for some of these lenses. So for the power, I ended up with, uh, well, let's look at the steps leading to that. So in order to calculate the power, remember the power is going to come out in diopters. And the diopters are inverse meters. So the first step here is to convert my focal length into meters and then just do the inverse. So 1 over 0.87 and that gives me 1.15 diopters. So that's, um, that's the power of the lens um, plus 1.15 diopters, not, not an especially powerful lens. Um, Now, let's go back and look. Whoops. So, the other part of the problem says that if we place an object 200 meters away from this lens, I place an object 200 meters away, uh, where is the image going to be located? And um, now that we know what the focal length is, we can add the additional information about the placement of the object and now that I know where the object is placed, I know what the focal length is for this lens, uh, we can combine those and calculate the, um, the image distance. The image distance for this worked out to be 154 centimeters. Okay. So, um, you know, I worked from the information that was given. Uh, on any of these examples, if, if you guys catch any mistakes, uh, let me know right away. So let me know, and, and as soon as I find out, then I can get that information after the rest of the class. Just something I, I want to mention from time to time as a reminder uh, to let me know. Uh, what would happen if? Let's do some what ifs here. What does this for, uh, formula tell me uh, if I wanted to have a, a focal length that was... Uh, much shorter. If I wanted to have a lens that was much larger in terms of power, how could we do that? And uh, so if we wanted to have something that was much larger in power, what we could do is, we got to get back to that formula, huh? Or we could work from here. So let's see, if I wanted to get this number uh, to be uh, more uh, a, a larger power. So we'll say power is equal to 1 over f, which is equal to this whole thing. So I can say that the power is equal to this formula. Well, it's going to have a more powerful lens if we use a higher index of refraction, right? So that index of refraction uh, is going to make a difference. And then if I make the, uh, if I used both curvature, uh, curvatures, as being positive, for example, that would give me an extra um, converging type of lens. And so we could, we could have a lens that bulges on both sides. Uh, that would be more converging. So if we had something where the lens bulged out on both sides, those two surfaces would reinforce each other and make it extra, um, extra powerful lens, extra short focal length. The other thing we could do is we could, um, we could look at uh, 
a diverging lens, a very you know, low focal length diverging lens, we could have both surfaces bend the other way. So if we had both surfaces that were um, concave, then both the R values would be negative, and those would add together, and that would give us something that was um, a very small focal length, a very powerful lens. All right, let's take a look at um, some cameras. What would the setup be on a camera? So here's some basic parts. There's a lens. Uh, there's a, 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 a box that uh, doesn't let any light in. Uh, there's a shutter to open the open up the uh, camera and then close down quickly. And then uh, an electronic sensor. Now it could be that if you still use uh, could be you know some photographers photographers still use film. I'm not sure what situations that would be in. For the most part, it's going to be a, a sensor that gets used. So here is the lens for the camera. And uh, what we've done is uh, there's an iris in here to determine how much light we're going to let in towards the sensor. So we can open that wide if we want a lot of light coming in, uh, but we could narrow it down if we only want a bit. This is, I mean, if you're thinking of the human eye, this is like the pupil, right? If it's really bright outside or inside a room or something, then the pupil gets narrower, doesn't let so much light in, but if um, the light becomes more dim, then the pupil will open up to try and allow more light to come in. Now, one of the issues you run into with opening up uh, opening up the uh, iris on the lens, opening up the aperture, um, is that the lens may have imperfections in it. So the lens might not be perfect, and as you open it up, you're including more and more paths that pass through the lens. Uh, if the iris or the aperture is really tiny, then you're really only using a small portion of the lens, kind of that central region. If I only use a small part of the lens, uh, I, I will tend to get a sharper picture. Uh, same thing with the human eye, we'll tend to get a sharper image on the retina if we're using, um, if the pupil has shrunk down. So, um, you know, when I was a kid, my parents would come in the room and I'd be doing homework and uh, they would say, what, what are you doing in here? Turn on some lights. You can't see in here. Uh, how can you see without a bunch of lights on? And as a kid, I always wondered what they were talking about uh, because I could see just fine. Um, and uh, what happens is, as you get older, uh, the lenses that your eye came with have, um, they develop uh, more imperfections. The, the, the curvature of the surfaces is not as uniform over time. And that means that when the pupil opens up and allows a lot of light in, uh, you do have, um, it, it is more difficult to see. Things are not as sharply focused as when you turn on the lights. And so I, I think that's what was going on here, is uh, I, I find myself doing the same thing now. I find myself in a room reading something and thinking, boy, I need some better light. And uh, the better light is to get my pupils to shrink down. And if my pupils shrink down, then I'll be using just the central part of my part portion of my lens in my eyes, and uh, then I won't have to deal with the variations along the surface. If I only use part of the lens, then I'm getting a sharper image. All right. Uh, so the camera has a sensor at the back here. Now, if we set this up in terms of what we've been talking about, for a camera, there's going to be an object that's outside of the camera, right? So we're going to have an object out here somewhere. We're going to have light that comes in towards this single converging lens. And then the idea would be to adjust the position of the lens. This lens can move forward or back in my camera. Because what I want to do is I want to have the image land right on that sensor. So on that plane of electronic sensors at the back of my camera, 
I want that to be where the image is located. Now what we've seen in doing some of these calculations is that, uh, well, this is going to be the image distance. So that's my image distance back here. And um, I know that the image distance will vary with the object distance. If I change the object distance, uh, the image distance is going to change also. So I do need to have that lens be able to move back and forth. So it's either a little closer to the back or a little farther away from the back of my camera. So that's the idea with the camera. It's a single converging lens. And then here they've got a picture of um, what the uh, sensor needs to look like. Um, so it's showing that you have uh, the sensor in order to get color photos, you need to have color sensitive um, sensors. So the sensors uh, within a square, so let's say here's one pixel in, the, uh, in my camera, in the sensor array, there's one pixel that's right there. And that, um, that one pixel has an area that's sensitive to blue, a sensitive that's area to red, a uh, an area that's sensitive to green. And again, what we're doing with that is we're matching human vision. So in our retinas, uh, we have um, cones and rods, right? I hope I get this right. The rods are for grayscale and the cones are for color, if I remember right. And there's kind of three different populations of cone cells. Uh, there's a red group, um, a red population, a green and a blue. Those uh, photoreceptor cells, the color photoreceptor cells, that are uh, just a little different. They're tweaked a little bit in terms of the proteins that are holding the rhodopsin molecules, and they absorb at a slightly different photon energy. So photons that are a little more energy, we experience those as blue. They're going to get picked up by the so-called blue photoreceptors. With the molecules, that have you know different quantum states inside that are going to uh, uh, preferentially absorb the blue part of the spectrum. And then the same thing applies for the red and the green. So in the camera, there's going to be a little bit of range over which distances, uh, over which objects are going to be in focus. So if I've got a bunch of objects uh, out in front of the camera, I have to decide which part of that am I going to focus on? Which part do I want the camera to actually be focusing on uh, for, my, for my picture that I'm taking? And so if you hold up a camera, which I guess you, you don't do so much anymore, and look at the field, uh, you can look at um, which objects are in focus and which ones are out of focus. And human vision works the same way, too. Um, so within the human eye, we have, um, we have a flexible lens. So there's a lens inside there. Uh, that is flexible, and it's actually the flexibility of the lens that allows us to focus at different distances. So the lens can be uh, made to be more bulged, so it's more converging, or it can be, become less bulged, so it's not quite so converging. Um, and that's how the, the eye handles that. Uh, so all they're showing really here is that we have some objects that are very close in our visual field, and objects that are farther away. Right now, the camera has been focused, the lens has been put in a location where objects at this distance, the light from those is being focused on that uh, sensor. Now, if we wanted to instead have the distance be in focus and have the stuff close by be out of focus, then uh, the lens would need to be uh, probably brought in closer, I want to say. Uh, so the lens would come in closer, and then we would be able to um, be able to focus on those distant objects. Now you do this very immediately, right? This is one of the things that's, that's amazing about uh, well, vision or human vision, uh, is that you could be looking at a book or something and focusing on something really close, reading it, and somebody calls out to you, 
and you look up, during that time when you look from focusing at something near until you're looking at, at focusing at something far away, um, those muscles surrounding the lenses inside your eye have to relax. And that's part of learning to see. So, um, you know, as, as, as a, probably an infant, looking around at your surroundings, um, you have learned how to control those muscles, and now it's just, it's just involuntary. Um, you, it just happens automatically. You don't have to stop and tell yourself, oh, I need to focus on that distant object. Your eyes just do that. So if you're looking at something near, you're looking at something far away, doesn't make any difference, uh, your eyes will adjust uh, to be in focus for those, for those objects. So here's a camera uh, example here. Uh, example 33A, camera focus. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to take a camera with a focal length of uh, 50 millimeters or 5.0 centimeters. And we want to know where should the lens be placed so that we can see an object, uh, so the camera can have an object three meters away and it will be in focus. So here's kind of what the example looks, looks like. Uh, taking a look at the example, so here is uh, here is the lens. Now if we were looking infinitely far away there would be a certain distance uh, between the lens and the sensor. For uh, an object at infinity, the lens would be at di equals to f. So for an object at infinity, uh, we would need to have that di distance be 5 centimeters, and that would be this distance right here, distance between where the lens is and where the... Um, the sensor array is located within the camera. Now what we want to do is we're going to change the object distance to 3 meters. So the 3 meters is going to be 300 centimeters. And what we can do then is uh, put in the value for the focal length, that is 5, and then put in the distance out to the object. So the object distance here was 300 centimeters. Now that's a lot of focal lengths. And that's typically how cameras are designed. Cameras are designed so that you're looking at objects that are many, many focal lengths away. And the way that works for us, or for the camera, is that if you remember these graphs that we did, what we're trying to do is find a region uh, for the, the properties of the lens within our camera. We're trying to find a region on that mathematical graph where uh, we can get a wide range of DOs with very small variations in DI. And that's where this graph is out, getting pretty close to the asymptote. So if you look along the asymptote right here, DO varies a lot. But DI varies very little. And that's going to work as long as the DO region is many, many, many focal lengths uh, then the camera lens doesn't have to move back and forth very much. It works pretty well without having to move back and forth a lot. Uh, here are the asymptotes, the D, not, the D object equals F, the DI equals F. Uh, I guess let's go back and, oh, it's right here. Uh, so we put the numbers in, this turned out to be 5.085 centimeters. So the lens didn't have to move very far. Uh, the lens only had to move uh, less than a millimeter, okay, if I'm reading that right. So I was, I had the camera looking at something out at infinity, I was using it, and I needed that five centimeters, that, that distance. And then in order to see something even closer, I need a little bit more room, because as we place something closer and closer, the light coming in is angled at a sharper angle. I need a little more room between object and, and image to do that. And so, or for the, for the image to form. And so, you know, the camera lens, if it's an autofocus, then the camera lens will automatically move back, or if you're focusing it, then you're going to adjust it. 
and uh, it's going to adjust to some region like this so that it, uh, it now matches up. Okay, now that's probably a good place to end for the day. I think I'll leave that. We'll come back. Uh, gosh, you got to remember everything about the camera because now we're going to come back. Look at the human eye and uh, we want to see how that uh, is going to compare with the camera. Um, okay, let's do that. I, I will stop there.